حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Rasul Allah Habib Allah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah wa kafa وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا my dear viewers as we agreed yesterday and after checking out the survey alhamdulillah there was uh, I, i don't want to say uh, general consensus but rather vast majority of the viewers um, agreed to change in the time and they thought it would be convenient Uh, due to the curfew in the country or in most countries and the lockdown. So welcome to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious and the first day of the blessed month of Sha'ban. A few days left, mashallah, for the blessed month of Ramadan. I want to seize this opportunity in the beginning and invoke the Almighty Allah to clear this crisis as soon as possible so that inshallah, All Muslims will witness a blessed month of Ramadan and they will get to pray the five daily prayers in the masjid in congregation and they will get to pray taraweeh and tahajjud and do i'tikaf and we see the haram full of mu'tamireen during Ramadan. Indeed Allah is able to do all things. The Prophet sallallahu says in the hadith, addu'a'u yanfa'u mimma nazala wa mimma lam yanzil. So the supplication invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely most efficient whether a calamity has taken place or befallen people or not yet. So keep making dua and you never know. You never know that let's try. No, be confident. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On behalf of humanity, the believers invoke the true Lord, the only God who is worthy of worship. We have seen people uh, of different faith and different belief um, and religions are calling the followers of their beliefs to gather in their places of worship and to invoke their God. We as Muslims believe that there is only one God and that is the ultimate truth and that is the only correct belief. So on behalf of humanity, on behalf of animals, on behalf of all living creatures, On behalf of the poor people who are living hand to mouth and now they are in lockdown and they don't have a chance to provide for their families as they used to before. On behalf of everything that exists, which Allah has created, we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we invoke him to make it easy for all of us and to cure all of us. We have indeed learned the lesson. And we have indeed benefited from this crisis and insha'Allah it will be a turning point in our lives. Allahumma farij anna ma nahnu fi. Allahumma akshif anna al-quraba wal-ghumam. Allahumma ashfi mardana warham mawtana. Allahumma ameen. Brothers and sisters, today's episode is number 525. I don't want you to feel Sometimes you're going live from home and sometimes you're going live from the studio once at uh, 5 p.m. Mecca time and once at whatever time because we're all experiencing hardship. So whenever it is convenient, we do whatever is most convenient. And we keep in mind the welfare and the health of the staff and the crew who are working with us. Because to be honest with you, to go live from the studio, we have to have tens of people on board. So... In the light of the new events, we'll see what is best, inshallah. And I know you're going to bear with us. You're going to make dua for us. And you're going to support us as we all support each other by making dua. Today, inshallah, <coughs> an episode number 525 in the seas of Riyad al-Salihin by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. Chapter number 240, the fourth episode in this chapter. باب فضل السماحة في البيع والشراء The excellence of fair bargaining and matters relating to it. We spoke about 
the importance of being fair, of being honest, of being trustworthy when selling, when buying, and of being kind and gentle upon demanding the repayment of the credit, the debt you lent somebody, and the virtues of all of that. With a new hadith today, and uh, this hadith is such a glad tiding and good news. This hadith and the following one, 1371, and the following one, 1372, three ahadith are a line of the same topic, which is the blessings and the excellence of being gentle and kind and pardoning people, the debtor, if you're a creditor, if they cannot pay on time, if they cannot settle their payment on time, so taking it easy on them. What do you get? What do you get from Allah in return? So this hadith 1370, Abu Huraira radiallahu an said, أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال كان رجل يداين الناس وكان يقول لفتاة إذا أتيت معسرا فتجاوز عنه لعل الله أن يتجاوز عنه فلقي الله فتجاوز عنه ده حديث متفق عليه So Abu Huraira May Allah be pleased with him narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said there was a person who used to loan money to the people. And he used to say to his servants, when a person who's a debtor come to you, or you go to collect the payment from him, show him leniency, take it easy on him, so that Allah the Almighty will forbear our faults. So when he met the Almighty Allah after death, the Almighty Allah forgive him all his sins as a result of that. The hadith doesn't need any further explanation. It's very obvious. But what I need to shed some light on is how this person was doing whatever he was doing for the sole purpose of hopefully Allah will forbear our faults. And that is exactly the meaning of إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Deeds are but by the intentions. And the meaning of Iman and Wahtisaban, in fact, not only Muslims, uh, you know, who are always forbearing, there are non-Muslims, there are people who sometimes don't believe in God, but they're kind, they're gentle, they're uh, lenient, and if they give loans, they take it easy, they take it easy on the debtors. But the difference is vast, like exactly the crisis that we're living in nowadays. We hear the figures are escalating. Um, you know, 6,000 people died in Italy or whatever. I don't know the exact figure by now. Um, hundreds of people died in this country or whatever. So we are like standing in a queue waiting for our turn. And as Muslims, we know we're going to die sooner or later. And whenever death comes, even if there is no a virus outbreak, even if it is not pandemic, death does not seek permission. So as a believer, as a Muslim, I'm on standby all the time. Whether it happens due to malignant tumor, a heart attack, you go to sleep and you never wake up, uh, a collision, a reason or another, what matters is the conclusion is the same. Death, the difference between Muslims and others is one thing, which is what comes next. So as a Muslim, I believe, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, if Allah were to choose me to die due to that viral outbreak, I know, inshallah, I'm a shaheed. So the family members may feel sad for losing me, or any family would feel sad for losing their loved ones, but they don't feel sad for good. They feel sad momentarily, and they know that he is in a better place, in a much better place, definitely. He's in Allah's mercy. While those who die while not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do they get? They get what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned them. The Quran described those who don't believe in the oneness of Allah, when they return to Him, they are the greatest losers. Why? Because they used to do and work hard in the dunya, assuming 
أنهم يحسنون صنعا they're doing good while in fact it wasn't for Allah's sake uh, so that's why we learn from this hadith a very specific meaning this man the rich man who used to give loans he was a creditor he used to give loans to people and then whenever he would send his employees to collect the payment you say take it easy on them if they cannot afford it now why hopefully Allah will forbear our faults hopefully Allah will remit our sins as a result that is called what ihtisaban we said we're approaching Ramadan it's just around the corner so the hadith which we normally hear it in Ramadan thousands and thousands of times man sama Ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. Likewise for the qiyam, likewise for uh, the, uh, uh, the Laylatul Qadr. There are three different hadith in this respect, right? But imanan, you're doing this out of belief in Allah. Ihtisaban, and anticipating the promised reward from Allah. So this man was doing so not to be said not because he was running for an office or he was preparing for the upcoming elections and he wants people to speak good about him no he wasn't a politician he wasn't a liar he was true to himself and he said it clearly to his servants to his employees and his workers whenever you collect the payment take it easy on people hopefully allah will forbear our faults as a result make sense Yes, that makes a lot of sense. So he died and he found what he expected. So when he died, automatically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbear uh, and forgave his faults. Why? Because he was anticipating that. And he was doing whatever he was doing for this reason. You'll be rewarded in accordance to what you're doing. Sometimes you intend and you don't have the means to do. You will be rewarded in, according, or in accordance with your intention if you cannot afford the means. The following hadith and the following one, 71 and 72, 13, 71 and 13, 72, as I said, they revolve around the same meaning with different narrations. Listen to this. Listen and enjoy. I bear witness. Brothers and sisters, I bear witness, I feel the luckiest person that I believe in the oneness of Allah. I feel the luckiest person that Allah chose me to be among the believers. You see, the vast majority of people do not believe in the oneness of Allah. And the vast majority of Muslims who are either Muslim by birth or by name, they do not practice the deen. So when you find yourself reading his book, Offering your prayer, reciting your adhkar, learning his deen, that's a blessing, not because you're genius, not because you're very righteous. That's a sign that Allah chose you and facilitated guidance for you. He gave you hidayah to tawfiq. Look what Prophet Shu'aib said in Surah Hud, in Urid wa illa al islaha mastata'at. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِي إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ My success is only with Allah. So when you read those ahadith, you should be proud of yourself. You should be proud of your messenger. You should be proud of the Qur'an which was revealed unto him. You should be proud of being chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a follower of his true religion. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Abu Mas'ud al-Badri رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حوسب رجل ممن كان قبلكم فلم يوجد له من الخير شيء إلا أنه كان يخالط الناس وكان موسرا وكان يأمر غلمانه أن يتجاوزوا عن المعسر قال الله عز وجل نحن أحق بذلك منه تجاوزوا عنه رواه مسلم الله أكبر Allah is the greatest. Abu Mas'ud al-Badri, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, told them that 
a man from among the nations before us, was called to account by Allah on the day of resurrection, indicating that uh, what will take place on the day of judgment. Or when he died, Allah the Almighty ran a quick accounting for him, so he is expecting the upcoming result. In any case, when this man was called to account by Allah the Almighty, no good deeds were found in his credit except that he being a rich man, having financial means, dealing with people, and he used to command his workers to show leniency to those who were uh, strained in strained circumstances, in financial difficulties. So when he died, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, and he said to his angels, Allah Azza wa Jalla, the exalted, the majestic, the most high, said, I am more entitled to this attribute, so wave his faults. I'm more worthy of being forbearing. I'm more worthy of being kind, so show kindness to him. How, ya Allah, forgive all his sins and admit him to paradise. There are a lot of things that we need to tackle in this hadith. Number one, some people will say, Sheikh, to be honest with you, I'm kind of confused. Whenever you guys say somebody was accounted and somebody entered Jannah, is Jannah and Nar around? Do they actually exist? Are they being created already? Or will they be created on the Day of Judgment? From numerous Quranic references, ayat in the Quran, and sound a hadith and the journey of Al Mi'raj, we confirm Al Jannah to Anna, heaven and hellfire, have been created and they are already existing. And every day the Jannah is adorned. Why? Anxiously waiting for its inhabitants to come and enter it. And every day, far of hell, is warmed up, is heated up, anxiously waiting for the wicked, the criminals, and the oppressors to enter it in order to face their fate. Oh, I'm just giving you the summary. Okay? We can spend the rest of the episode quoting references that Al Jannah and Nar do exist, both of them currently. That is the first question. The second question. Whenever we say during the journey of Al Mi'raj, the Prophet ﷺ have seen some people in heaven. And also, besides that, in some night visions, the Prophet ﷺ gave Bishara to some of his companions that not only that they will enter paradise, the, 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 they have their places already booked and their palaces already built, and the workers and the servants are working hard day and night waiting for the return for their entry to Al Jannah. Didn't he say to Umar ibn Khattab, I have seen your palace in paradise? Yes, he did. Uh, didn't he say to Bilal ibn Rabah, may Allah be pleased with him, that when he woke up for Fajr, he said, I saw in a night vision Al Jannah, and I heard your footsteps in Al Jannah. What does it mean? Does it mean physically Bilal is living and walking on earth and then he is alive in paradise? Even though Bilal outlived the Prophet No, it doesn't mean that. But it means rejoice, ya Bilal. Your seat in Jannah is confirmed. Rejoice, O Umar. You have a palace in paradise. He said to Abdullah ibn Salam, the former Jewish rabbi, he's been Ahl al-Jannah. He said to certain people by the name, you will be in paradise. Yani, when the day of resurrection takes place, you will enter Al-Jannah. Watch. So that means they are being promised, but they have not made it physically yet. And no one will enter paradise before the day of judgment is established and before the reckoning would have started and before Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would set his foot in Al-Jannah. In the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Fa'ati bab al-jannah. After the intercision and the, uh, you know, the reckoning, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now is leading his ummah and the believers are following. 
whether the believers of Prophet Moses or Prophet Jesus or Prophet Zachary or Prophet Noah, Prophet of all the prophets, everyone wants to enter Al Jannah to enjoy peace, tranquility, and to calm down. And it is eternal. So the Prophet said, So I shall come to the gate of paradise. And I knock on its door. So the guard of Jannah will say, Who is it? I will say, This is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. I'm Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. So the guard of Al Jannah, the angel will say, Bika umirtu Allah aftaha li ahadin qablak. Well, indeed, I was commanded by Allah not to open the door of Al Jannah to anyone before you. Then the Prophet will be the very first person to set his foot in paradise. And then the believers will follow the prophets the messengers and their followers, those who truly believed in the oneness of Allah and in the messages of their prospective messengers, then they shall enter paradise. Okay. But I believe when you guys were all in high school or middle school and we were told that we're having a field trip or a graduation or we're going to have fun tomorrow, we can't sleep. All night we're anxiously waiting, we're excited. We want to go to attend the party or the graduation or the ceremony or the wedding uh, or, the, or, the, or the trip, the field trip as kids. And as we grow up, when you know that tomorrow will be your first day and job, you're excited. Then you've been promoted, you become the COO. So tomorrow, not like the rest of the past 20 years because you're going to be in the office as a CEO or as a manager. It's different, you're excited. As a result of this excitement, you feel happy. So the food is served. I'm like, I don't wanna eat, why? Because I feel like I'm full. You haven't eaten anything since the morning. You're excited, you're happy, you're delighted. This delight, this excitement happens to people when they die and they are told about their seat in heaven. Yani they are assured, so now we can tell them, rest in peace. You know when those guys watch the movie and they say, rest in peace to somebody who is a non-believer and he dies, how do you know that he's gonna rest in peace? <laughs> huh? How do you know? Because in the barzakh, in the life after we die and until resurrection, there is nothing called all of us are inert, lying down, or asleep, or being hypnotized. No, Habibi. Uh, the grave is either a garden of paradise, or God forbid, a pit of hellfire. So when people, they die, and they're buried, and then they are questioned. Al-Qabr, the grave, is the first stage of the hereafter. And they, finally, they know that, MashaAllah, they pass the test, and they will be informed innocently. You don't have to wait for a month or two or to, to, to see the results or go online to check it out. Right on the spot. After the angels will ask you, Marabuk Madinu Kamatakulu Faraju Ladi Buatha Fikum the three known questions. So the results will appear. Either the beautiful, nice looking man with a bright face, uh, smelling great, amazing aroma. Who are you? I'm your good deeds. Then he will see his seat in paradise. He will keep saying, Rabbi Aqim establish the day of judgment. So his grave will be a garden of paradise. That is the meaning. And the opposite is also true for a person who is wicked. Fail to answer the questions. He was worshipping a stone. He was worshipping a human being. He was worshipping a cross, a piece of wood. Or he did not believe in anything the same. Who is your Lord? Huh? Huh? I don't know. And uh, what is your religion? I don't know. What do you say concerning this man? I have no clue about him. Then this ugly looking man with an offensive smell would appear to him in the grave. This is called Ilm al Ghaib. And I haven't seen it. None of us have seen it because none of us have entered the grave with a dead person to see what happens. But as Muslims, we believe in it because we believe in what is known as Al Ghaib in the unseen. What comes after death is only known to Allah. So when the Almighty Allah the Creator tells us, we definitely believe in it. And that's why if you are a non-Muslim and you're watching this and you think this is crazy, I would kindly request you not to leave a comment, rather leave the page. Because we are talking to the believers. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah, the whole world 
has realized how vulnerable, how weak, how fragile we are. We're talking about the Creator. We're not talking about a microorganism or a virus. We're talking about the Creator there. So if you're interested, join in. We'll be more than happy to have you because we are studying our religion. We're studying our faith. We're studying the revelation of God to us, which tells us about the truth, the ultimate reality, the inevitable life after death. Now, the Prophet وسلم, said this man believed in all of that. He didn't really prepare much, but as a businessman, he utilized his wealth to do something good. This good brought ease to a lot of people. So the beneficiaries were not only his family members, sons or daughters. They were people who were in debt, who had borrowed money from him, and they were desperately in need. So he said, take it easy on them. Why, mister? He said, because I'm hoping on the day when God will question me, and whenever I will be held accountable, this will show up, and Allah will give me credit for that. But is that deed enough? That is a question which will tackle its answer, inshallah, when we come back from a short break. Brothers and sisters, we'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes. Please hang around, and we'll see you in a few minutes. The Prophet says, Each and every one of us is a shepherd. And each shepherd is responsible for his flock. There's nothing more beautiful, more pleasing, more pleasure inducing to a parent than to see their children being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As parents, we are responsible for our children. We're responsible to upbring them to be righteous practicing Muslims. We're responsible to make them positive elements of our community. There's nothing more beautiful than for a parent to see their sons and their daughters being obedient to Allah and following in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu With every great amana comes great responsibility. In order to know how to do this, in order to gain knowledge of how to be successful in aligning our upbringing to the Quran and the Sunnah, Join us on this episode, on these segments of Life's Adornments. Myself, Yusuf Kroma, and Sheikh Asim Lukman Al-Hakim, we will take you on a journey, on a lesson-filled enlightenment where we will discuss these crucial matters. We look forward to having you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Alhamdulillah, I got rid of the phones and they are with the brothers in the control. Let me remind you with the phone numbers is a very hectic job to be presenting the program and answering the calls. Um, and now I really appreciate the job that they do. The phones are ringing currently. The phone numbers are area code 002 then 023 area code 002 then 01005469323. WhatsApp numbers area code 001-347-80625. And finally, area code 001-361-489-1503. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Fatima from the UK, welcome to the program. Okay, um, Assalamu alaikum. I want to ask a question regarding celebrating birthday in Islam. Celebrating what? Birthday. Okay. Birthday. Birthday. Is it your birthday? Yes. Is it he or she? No, it's not mine. I do. I'm talking about. No, the I just want to know the rule. I'm, I'm talking about the kid who says birthday. In the background. Hello. Okay, Sister Fatma. I, that is the one. Hello? 
Okay. I got your question, Sister Fatina. Yeah. Uh, imagine, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, while we are experiencing this crisis, and uh, God forbid somebody who is tested positive and their birthday is today or tomorrow, would they really think of celebrating birthday? Oh, of course not. That doesn't make any sense. Somebody is fighting for life, for his or her life. And in reality, without the uh, virus outbreak, we as Muslims look into life like that. So every day that brings us closer and closer to our destiny, to our meeting point with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why neither the Prophet وسلم, nor any of his companions really cared much about their celebration of their birthday or their commemoration of the death day. Rather they worried about how to make the best use of every day that they live and they witness. Wallahu alam. I know that some people out there who do celebrate it. I don't call them rebellious or anything, but I myself, I do not do that because I perceive light differently. Or I'm trying my best to imitate the practices of the Prophet ﷺ. Trust me, if he, if he had done that or he had uh, you know, celebrated his birth or any of the companions, uh, all the righteous people, I would be the first to do that for my kids. The celebrations at home is when, alhamdulillah, any of the children achieve something good. So we make a party, we celebrate, we give them presents. But when it comes to the practices which are adopted by other nations, other than Muslims, I'm not really too keen into following that. I rather follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ. I hope the answer suits you, Sister Fatima from the UK. <coughs> we have Muhammad Lawan Bulama. Bulama is asking, please, Sheikh, I want to know the answer for this question. Where is Prophet? Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him. Is he not in Jannah? Many Christians ask this question. Okay? The only religion which can answer this question is Islam. Why? Because Allah has told us where is he. Other religions, including uh, those who say that we follow Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, they're confused. I don't know whether he's killed, crucified, alive, or dead. But from an Islamic perspective, the Quran is full of indications which show us exactly. Number one, Isa alayhi salam was neither killed nor crucified. You find that in Surah An Nisa, ayah number 157, ayah number 158, the two consecutive ayahs, chapter number four, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ They neither killed him nor crucified him, rather they did kill somebody else and crucify somebody else. Then Allah the Almighty says by the end of ayah uh, uh, number uh, 158, the following ayah, uh, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا And for certain, they have not killed him, he wasn't touched. بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ What happened to him? Allah raised him unto him. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا And Allah is ever my almighty, all wise. So raised him unto him where? Is he in Jannah now? Is he alive? Is he dead? We know from the hadith and also the indications of the ayah, وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ That Jesus, the son of Mary, peace be upon him, will return to earth. And his return is perceived as one of the major signs that perceives the establishment of the Day of Judgment. Great. Okay. So currently, is he alive or dead? I just quoted the ayah. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا For sure, he was not killed. For sure, he was not crucified. So what happened to him? He was raised. Raised where? He was raised to heaven. You mean heaven, which we will enter after we die, then the believers will enter it? No. Al-Jannah, Allah the Almighty says, سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا The heaven, as-sama, the sky, the actual sky, not the uh, the the, the the atmosphere that surrounds us consists of seven layers. The first is known as the worldly heaven, then the second heaven, the third, the fourth, all the way up to the seventh heaven. In the journey of Al Mi'raj, in the hadith which is collected by Imam Bukhari and Muslim, Prophet Muhammad met in the first heaven, 
Prophet Adam, peace be upon him. And he greeted him and he greeted him back. Marhaban bil ibn salih wa nabi salih, welcome. A righteous son and a righteous prophet and he greeted him back. Then when he was escorted to the second heaven, he met whom in the second heaven? Second layer of heaven. He met the cousins, Prophet Jesus peace be upon him and Prophet Yahya, his cousin, his maternal cousin. And they both greeted him. Marhaban bil akhi salih wa nabi salih. Welcome a righteous brother and a righteous prophet. So he met whom? Prophet Isa alayhi salam where? In the second heaven and then he is there until he is descent by the end of time which could be near Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best assalamu alaikum Nadi from Ethiopia assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh sheikh yes Nadi welcome to the program I want to ask you a question yeah Nadi, go ahead. Uh, I want uh, the Moscow is closed by coronavirus. How to pray Friday prayer at Moscow? Pray. In, you know. Okay, I got your question, yeah, Nadi from Ethiopia. And yesterday there were four callers who asked about the same question. Um, <laughs> I like the simplicity of the brother who says that the mosques are closed by the coronavirus. <laughs> the coronavirus is a creature cannot be seen by the regular microscope. You need an electron microscope to see it. They say it's big in size. You know what it means it's big in size compared to other viruses. It's like three to four hundred nanometers. But still, you know, to see it, you need an electron microscope. In any case, Pray jama'ah at home of the five daily prayers. You and your missus, you and your kids, you and whoever, and your parents, even if it is one, for the five daily prayers. For Jumu'ah, you have the concession to pray it zuhr. Four rakas. You exempt from Jumu'ah because there is no mosque open. But in six minutes, last Saturday or Friday, I posted a video of the ishtihad of some of the scholars of the permissibility of holding the Jumu'ah at home due to the current circumstances. So instead of repeating myself, it's only six minutes. You can check it out and you will know whether you're entitled to pray Jumu'ah at home and with whom. Assalamu alaikum. Baba from Gambia, Assalamu alaikum. You see, now when I call you, I have to say, Brother Baba. Or the viewers would think I'm talking to Baba. <laughs> yeah, the, the name I'm named after uh, after my grandfather. That's why I, I get called Baba. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but when people call you, like when your boss call you at work, does he say <laughs> Baba? No. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, brother Baba. What is your okay. question? Um, I have a question to ask about hand sanitizer. Yes. Um, I've been hard around in it um, uh, alcohol is all included. So if we have a wudu, I mean, is it uh, permissible to, I mean, apply the sanitizer? Yes, it is permissible. Okay. Yeah. What is not permissible about alcohol is its consumption. Barakallah feek, brother, yeah. Baba. Okay. So the hadith we addressed and we quoted the hadith of Husi Barajulum Mimman Kana Kablakum, a man. Uh, from the nations before us and then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, when he died he questioned him he held him accountable and he said do you have any good deeds he says no but only one thing that whenever I used to lend people money I used to ask my workers to be lenient with them and so on so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Nahnu ahaqqu bidhalika min. I'm more entitled for such trait for such quality than him so pardon him and forgive him his sins and accordingly he was saved. Some people would look into the hadith and many other similar hadith but different incidents. Like the man who removed the branch of a tree from the street of people and then he was entitled to enter paradise. فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ Allah thanked him. And when Allah thanks somebody, the kind of thanks will be by remitting all the sins and admitting the person to paradise. Oh, okay, I'm going to remove all the branches 
of the trees from the path of people. Good for you, but I'm talking about the mechanism and the secret behind such a simple deed with a huge reward. After this call, inshallah, assalamu alaikum. Idris from Pakistan, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu ya sheikh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, akhi Idris, go ahead. Uh, sheikh, I had uh, two questions. Uh, my first question was, uh, can you please uh, tell me the correct uh, form of uh, uh, doing uh, Rafal Adain? And my second question was, uh, whenever I suggest uh, my friends or uh, family members that they should uh, perform the uh, Rafal Adain because it, uh, it is uh, said in an authentic hadith, uh, but uh, they usually uh, point out that uh, uh, they don't do it. Uh, and uh, are we supposed to follow a proper uh, imam like Hanafi or Hanbali or uh, any other uh, great scholars of us? Or uh, we are supposed to only follow the Sunnah in the Quran only? Thank you. Okay, you're most welcome. Barakallah feek. There are two ways to raise the hands in the prayer, whether in the beginning takbir or the takbir of moving from one position to another, such as going for ruku, rising up from bound down and rising up to the third rak'ah, which is where your hands will be parallel to your, uh, the thumb parallel to the earlobe. Okay, so you can do this or this, okay? And the other way is when the hands, when the palms are parallel to your shoulders, the palms are parallel to your shoulders. Both are correct. Barakallahu feek. Akhi Idris, we never belittle any of the practices of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But my advice to you is, in the community in which you're living, I've seen a lot of people, they need to learn more about the proper belief in the oneness of Allah. They need to be educated in respect of how to invoke Allah, not others. They need to eliminate a lot of false practices which are inherited from cultural practices of other religions. So I would advise you to give precedence to that. They pray in the masjid uh, when I pray in Pakistan. If I think people get offended when I raise my hands, especially if I'm leading the prayer, I avoid doing that. It's sunnah and it will not invalidate the prayer. But maintaining the unity among the community should be given precedence. Your people are more in need to learn about belief, monotheism, and proper invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not associating with Allah partners in worship, such as in wearing talisman, in believing in bad omens, going to the soothsayers and consulting them. I'm not saying your people are doing so, but our people, we need to work on that most importantly. For those who pray, we tell them that you and I should follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ. If Abu Hanifa alayhi, was alive, he would most have definitely followed what he hear that is correct and sound the Prophet ﷺ used to do. But some people akhi, are stuck. Some people take it personal and they're very prejudiced. Leave them alone. Do not keep bugging them and then offending yourself and you know the answer will be the same. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Aisha from Gambia, last call. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Go ahead, Sister Aisha. Sister Aisha, طيب. Uh, are you uh, there? Si yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes, Sister Aisha, go ahead. Hello, Sheikh. I, I want to ask you a question. Please. I want to ask you a question. I know um, you want to ask a question. Go so ahead and I'm, ask. I'm asking you if you have uh, Quran on your mobile phone. Mm -hmm. <coughs> For example, you are on your monthly period. Is it possible that you can read the Quran on the, on the phone? Bye. 
got your question. Thank you. Um, according to the vast majority of the scholars, with that Imam Abu Hanifa, or Malik, or Shafi'i, and others, women during their period shouldn't be reading the Quran unless if they are revising Quran or teaching Quran, not as means of worship. But there is another opinion, such as Ibn Taymiyyah and others who say that even during the period since they don't have a solid reference, like a straightforward answer or a proof from the Prophet ﷺ forbidding women from reading Quran during the period. But there is a general consensus that any person in Janaba, whether women during their menses, men with sexual impurities after having sexual relations with dream, they're not allowed to touch the Quran, the word of Allah with bare hands. That doesn't apply to the virtual Quran on your tab, on your phone, on your app. So if you read the Quran and you're holding this, uh, uh, you know, phone or small device which has the Quran, this is not similar to holding a physical Quran. We ran out of time and inshallah Azza Jal remains for us uh, this interesting hadith 1372 in the same line of the previous hadith. Inshallah we'll get to discuss it next time. Until then. I invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on all of us. Allahumma fil lana dhunubana wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawafana ma'al abrar. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min al-barasi wal jununi wal judami wa sayyi al-asqam. Allahumma afina fi abedanina. Allahumma afina fi abasarina. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min al-kufri al-faqr. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min a'zab al-qabr. La ilaha illa ant. Allahumma arfa' maqataka wa ghadabaka anna. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Forgetting all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price